required rate of return. Let's have a look at an example. Suppose that we have two banks, ABC and XYZ, and currently ABC is offering 8% on their savings account. And what we want to do for this LOS is we want to interpret this 8%. So the first interpretation is as follows. If we deposit at bank XYZ, then you will miss the opportunity to earn 8% at bank ABC. So just imagine that these banks are located across the street from each other. If you were to take your money to XYZ, you will miss the opportunity to earn 8% at ABC. So the first interpretation of the 8% is that it's an opportunity cost. And the definition of opportunity cost is that it's the rate available on an alternative investment of equal risk. And this is an important distinction, equal risk. And here's the logic. Notice that we're comparing two banks with each other because that's a fair comparison. So we're not comparing the 8% at bank ABC with some return we could earn on a high risk speculative investment because that would not be a fair comparison. So for opportunity cost, you would have to look at an investment that is of equal risk to the underlying asset that you're looking at. Now let's look at the second interpretation of this 8%. If we indeed deposit our money at XYZ, so let's suppose we deposit $100 at XYZ, you would require a return of 8%. Now where is this coming from? Remember I said the, imagine that these two banks are located across the street from each other and you could see Bank ABC has this big advertisement outside its window that they're offering 8% on their savings account. So naturally, if I was to walk into bank XYZ, I would tell them, I say, hey, you know, I need 8% on this uh, deposit I'm going to make or else I'll go to ABC. And, and that's where the term required return comes in from, because when you go to XYZ, you will require 8% or else you're going to go somewhere else. Now, supposing that uh, XYZ agrees and they say, OK, we'll pay you 8%. Remember, you deposit $100 at the beginning of the year. Therefore, at the end of year one, you will have your initial capital back plus 8% interest, which works out to $8. So you'll get a, a total amount of $108 at the end of the first year. Now, the third interpretation of this 8% is as follows. If we discount the future value of $108 at a rate of 8%, its present value today would be a hundred dollars so the third interpretation of the eight percent is that it's a discount rate and you can see why it's called the discount rate ladies and gentlemen because we're going from 108 to 100 you're discounting so let's have a look at a visual framework of what's going on so here's the beginning of the year here's the end of the year and uh, as we said before imagine you walk into uh, either of these banks and you deposit a hundred dollars today and we would require 8%. So at the end of the year, we would have 108. But now I can turn the tables and I could say, well, what if you're promised an investment uh, that'll pay you $108 in one year? How much are you willing to pay for it today? Well, if I'm going to be getting $108 a year from now, what's the only way I can earn a return? By paying a lower price for it today. Well, how much lower? 8%. So in this context, the 8% would be referred to as the discount rate. So do you see, ladies and gentlemen, uh, why we discount cash flows? We discount cash flows so that we can build in a return. So now what we're going to look at is how we actually computed these figures. In other words, the future value at the end of the uh, year one or alternatively present value as of today. Let's start off with the future value calculation. I showed it to you before, but I want to break it down step by step so that we arrive at the framework um, that's used in the curriculum. So the 108 was derived as follows. Here's our initial $100. Uh, so at the end of the year, at the end of the year, we get our principal back plus interest. And this is for one period. So we just compound for one period. So that's how we get 108. So to arrive at the framework, all we got to do is we got to replace these values with their corresponding variables. So the 108 is the future value, 100 is the present value, 8% is the required rate of return, and of course the 1 is the time period or your holding horizon. 
So now we're going to go the other way. Now we're going to say, well, how would we find the present value? In other words, if we're given the future amount, how would we find out what it's worth today? Well, all we did is we took the 108 and we discounted it by that 8% for one period. And that's how we got the 100. The other thing, of course, we could have done is uh, just rearrange this framework uh, that we had for future value. So you're just now uh, solving for present value instead. So you can see it's future value divided by 1 plus r to the power of t. And just to reiterate uh, what I said before, because this is a very important concept, because throughout the CFA program, all three levels, we're going to be doing a lot of valuation. In other words, we want to find out how much a stock or a bond is worth today. In other words, over here, we want to know what the value is today. So you're going to be given future cash flows, and you're going to be asked to calculate what the price is today. And as we demonstrated here, to find out what it's worth today, you have to discount these future cash flows. And the point I make here is as follows. When we discount these future cash flows, as I demonstrated, you're actually building in a return. In other words, by paying $100 today for an investment that will yield 108 in one year, we are building in a return of 8%.